Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achana. Welcome back to my code review series, a series in which you guys send me your code and I take a look at it. For the past few videos in this series, we've been looking at this path tracer that this young, young man has made. Today, we're gonna take a look at the meat of it, the actual code in the shader that does the path tracing and that does the math and the algorithms that lead us to be able to render these images. So buckle in. Now I expect this video to be the last one in this series. So if you wanna send me your code so that I can take a look at it for the next episode, send an email to churnareview at gmail.com. There will be more information in the description below. All right, I'm not gonna waste any time. We actually, last time we took a look at the rendering from like a high level using RenderDoc. And I talked about just how you can learn to read graphics applications better by using a graphics debugger. The video will be linked up there. I highly recommend you watch it, especially to get an overview of this project specifically as well. What we know is that we have a main kind of loop over here. And inside this main loop, we set up a whole bunch of different variables. We bind a vertex array, which is just a full screen quad that we can render to. And then we do the actual rendering over here using this default shader, default frag and default vert, which seems to contain all of the path tracing code in this project. And then after that, we do optionally some bloom. So some post-processing basically happens over here and then we just display it on the screen and that's it. That's the entire overview of how all the graphics passes work in this project. I wanna quickly mention that whilst this project is in fact straightforward and you can clearly see the shaders that we need to take a look at here, using RenderDoc like we did in that last video to find this is usually a much easier, quicker way to go if the project is even a little bit more complicated than this. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so here we have them. Here we have the two shaders. Let's start by taking a look at the vertex shader because that's gonna be quick and easy as you can see. All this does, and again, you can see it visually in a graphics debugger, which is why it's just such a good, good idea to do that. All this does is simply take in three floats, X, Y, Z, a position, which is stored inside our vertex buffer, and then it just puts it into GL position. So we're literally copying data from our vertex buffer over here into GL position, which determines the final basically the final output position on our screen in clip space, negative one to one. That is to say where that vertex specifically will appear on our flat 2D screen. And since we execute gel draw arrays with six vertices, this will happen six times at various negative one to one kind of values, you know, over here to draw two triangles. And that's what we end up with. If we really wanted to dig a little bit deeper and see where in the code that was happening, here is our draw arrays command with six vertices. What are they actually called? Just count, okay, sure. And then a couple of lines above that is binding the vertex array, rect VAO, rect vertex array object. If we take a look at that, you can see it's an instance of this class. And what is this class? Here are the vertices, right? So we have that negative one to one as well as UV coordinates as well. Good, I think that's so Sorted. Let's move in. Let's move on to the meat. All right. So default or frag. Uh, we have about 385 lines of code over here. Lots of stuff happening. Lots of tracing rays and doing like some closest object collision using SDFs and just a lot of stuff going on. You know what else is going on? Brilliant Dog, the sponsor of this video, has a 30 day free trial that you can use to check out their entire platform and learn all of the math that goes into this. Now, for those of you who don't know, Brilliant Dog is a platform filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. I constantly talk about how much I love their math courses and that's because they're extremely visual, engaging and interactive. All of the math that we're looking at here leads to a visual result. So teaching it in a way that isn't extremely visual to me is just crazy. But Brilliant takes that a step further. Take a look at this calculus course, for example. Yes, we are seeing visual graphs here, but you can interact with them. They have these widgets that you can play with to drag around the numbers, see what effect they have visually and how everything works. And then that goes a step further because they'll quiz you, they'll ask you questions every step of the way to make sure that you're learning and retaining this information. And if this kind of calculus is just too advanced for you, then Brilliant actually goes down all the way to this everyday math course, which is just a basic introduction to mathematics in general. And they also have some really good beginner computer science courses. But as I mentioned, they have a 30 day free trial. Just go to brilliant.org slash the channel and try out the entire platform. All of their courses, have a browse, see if you like them for free. And if you do go on to like them, then Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 subscribers 20% off an annual membership. Huge thank you as always to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. So where do we begin in this fragment shader? I think the best place to start is probably to just illustrate how it even works. So we know from that vertex shader that we looked at over here, that what we are drawing is two triangles that basically form this quad 
this rectangle. So the fragment shader now, it's gonna go through and it's going to rasterize this object into pixels. And it's not really the thing doing the rasterization per se, but it will be invoked. This code will be called once for every single pixel that we end up creating as part of our journey to transform this like geometry into actual pixels on our screen. So what that means is that the code that we're looking at over here will run once for every pixel. So inside the main function over here, you can kind of compare this to if you wrote this in C++, you would have like a nested for loop probably that goes through every pixel like on the Y axis and every pixel on the X axis nested within each other because you're going to go through every single pixel in the image you're rendering. But that's just happening externally and we're calling this for each iteration of that loop. You could think of it that way. So then the first thing we're gonna do here is get this UV coordinate by getting the gel frag coord, subtracting half of the resolution from it and then dividing it by the Y resolution. Now resolution, is a VEC2 that we take in. And if we take a look at it, you can see it's a VEC2 that is the width and the height. And the width is 1920, the height is 1080. Not strictly necessary to take in a uniform like this because there is actually a function called texture size, which you can use to get this. I probably would have just written it this way just cause it's a little bit easier to deal with. And then you would just pass in like this texture, I think, which is our previous frames. So if you just pass this in, and I think you have to specify which MIP as well, then you would basically get this resolution uniform variable. This would give it to you as an integer. You'd have to probably convert it to, a, to just a normal vector instead of an I vector. There's a little bit of converting, but that would get you that resolution variable basically. Okay, so frag chord X, Y, what is this? This is the pixel index of which pixel we're dealing with. Right, so if we know that the size is zero to 1920, a pixel in the middle on the X would be like, you know, half of that, 960, for example. Then what we're doing is we're subtracting half the resolution. So this is a VEC2, remember, and this is also a VEC2. So we halve the resolution, which basically on the X axis would take us now into a range of negative 960 to positive 960. So we're basically just centering around zero here. And then we divide it by the vertical resolution. So then we divide this by 1080. Now, the real question here might be, I, I would do this a little bit differently, but regardless, the real question here is why are we dividing by only the vertical resolution when we presumably want this to be X and Y? And the reason for that is because if we divide this by resolution, then we're going to get like a, a uniform distribution across the two axes, which isn't really true to the aspect ratio of the image. So what I mean by that is, let's just say you have 1920 and you have 1080. And if you divide those both by their respective maximums, then you're clearly gonna get 1.0 as the max here and 1.0 as the max here, if that makes sense. So we're actually losing the information about how these are in fact different. And that leads to obviously not a square image, but a rectangular image. We have an aspect ratio that isn't one. If we divide them both by 1080, then we're gonna get basically the factor of that aspect ratio. So this would be, I think this is a 16, this is 16, nine, yeah. So this would be like 1.7778. So now we have a UV that is roughly in like a negative one to one range, but it also also like honors or respects, <laughs> very, very honorable, it's aspect ratio, which is important. Okay, so this is just some random values, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, we just generate like a random value, I guess, that we're going to use. It looks like it's, it's creating like the state of the random number generator here. And then we have a color, we have array direction and array origin, so O here stands for origin, D stands for direction. When reading all these codes, reading all these projects, like it's cool how, I guess, with experience and with time, you, you just look like you just see the patterns of everything. That's why I always encourage people to just get out there on GitHub and just read code and just, you know, execute it, play with it, tinker with it. Just if you want to improve in a particular space, look at one project per week in that category. And I promise you, it's a little bit like becoming chat GPT or becoming an AI because you're obviously learning, you're training yourself with more and more data, with more and more information. And your brain will just naturally fall into that. This is kind of scary in a way how similar we are to AIs. Okay, so the ray direction here is just gonna basically be mutated by the camera and where it's looking because the idea is that from the camera position, if we look at our scene really quickly, uh, this is just basic ray tracing, but if we have like, let's just say we have a camera and it's over here, this is my camera. This is 2D, but pretend this is in a 3D world. The camera has an X, Y, and Z position and then it has some kind of aspect ratio, some kind of, you know, lens, let's just say on the camera, which will define the, the field of view. And we need to now determine the color of every pixel. So we do that by casting out a ray for every pixel into a given direction. Clearly this direction that we cast into 
from the origin, which let's just say is over here. So this is RO and this is RD. And for each one of these pixels, we're going to be casting out a ray to see what it hits. Oh, look, it hit a sphere. So therefore we can sample that color and you know, bounce the ray somewhere else. But this entire setup here is going to obviously be determined by where the camera is in 3D space and where it's looking at. So the ray origin is the camera's position. Where is it in 3D space? And then the ray direction will solely be dependent on the orientation of the camera. So once we have a ray direction and a ray origin, we can presumably begin actually tracing our rays and our paths. Now I would say like, just as a quick note here, I like to be a little bit more organized than this because as this project grows, you're gonna find that it's getting a little bit too cluttered if you have variables like this all over the place. So typically I like to create like a struct called Ray, which would define all of these things. So for example, it would have a VEC3 called origin, a VEC3 called direction. You might have like a, a dist like a max distance. Usually you have like a, a min distance and a max distance, stuff like that so that you could easily pass that around. So like for example, in ray trace, we have to pass two different variables here and not to mention it doesn't have any concept of a, a minimum and a maximum distance. Otherwise we'd just be able to pass in that ray. Another common name for it might be a ray description because this one specifically is describing how we want the ray to be cast. But that's really the only uh, feedback I have here. I mean, obviously this camera situation is like a little bit weird. We're not exactly going through any, so we've got camera rotation X, Y, Z, but we're not really going through any specific like field of view or like a, a projection matrix. I probably would do that, but it's okay. I think it's probably fine for like the, the level of this project. This is a bit weird. I would drop this down a little bit. Okay, so it looks like we're going through a number of samples here. So again, remember this is per pixel. Number of samples is set to, it's a uniform. Let's quickly take a look at it inside over here. So number of samples, random mode, five, sure. So it's important to remember there are several tiers uh, of how this works. There's this like, you know, per pixel tier. So on the pixel level, how many times will it be called? Within the pixel level, you can see we can actually trace ray per sample, right? So per pixel, we might do it a further, you know, five times or something uh, in this case, which is how many samples do we want? But then also it's going to be called progressively over several frames, right? So we have this like, you know, the fact that this image will be traced over several frames. So there's like a frame index, there's like a pixel index because it's going to be per pixel. And then within each pixel, it's going to be per sample. So that's really important to understand when you're trying to piece together exactly how this ray trace function is being called, because it's not just being called per pixel. It's not just being called at like for one frame, like once for to render the entire frame. It's going to be called across several frames, across all the pixels and across all the samples. So this is a very hot function. And then within this, we're going to also be casting array per reflection. And the max reflections here is also presumably defined in here. So there's like a random mode, so 12 and preview mode is one. So there's like two modes, I guess, one that's a lot faster for preview and one that's a lot slower for rendering. And then finally, we're getting into the meat, which is this ray trace or path trace function. Now, this is the most important part of this entire puzzle. Uh, I would say, and that is the color that we return at the end. This is our accumulated color. We started, as you can see, at one. Why do we start it at one? Great question. The best way to think of this, I think, and this is like always difficult, I think, to explain because the way that we do ray tracing and path tracing is kind of in reverse. So we, we do not begin with a light source that sends out rays to bounce around and then some of them will hit the camera. We begin with the camera ray and because that makes more sense because we know that we need color information for every single pixel on our screen. So for a resolution of 1920 by 1080, for example, we would send out about 2 million rays. Now that's not the total amount of rays for this specifically. We know we have five samples. So multiply that by five, that's about 10 million. And then we're gonna bounce them around as well. And then we're gonna accumulate them over several frames. So at the end of the day, it's a lot more than that amount of rays, but that makes more sense because we're guaranteed to look at the rays that will actually make it back to the camera and contribute something to our image. If we didn't, it would take a lot longer and we would be evaluating paths that never make it to our eye, to the observer, of the scene. So this essentially, you can think of it this way, this is like the light energy that is inside the scene. And again, because it's reverse, it might make less sense, but it still, it still checks out in the end. So just trust. We have a sphere in our scene. We have a ray that comes and hits it. When the ray hits it, light is reflected and absorbed in some way. So if this has a value of one, so we have 1.0 here, that's the, the light energy coming in. It will be somewhat absorbed by the object and somewhat reflected back. This is important because this is how we actually see 
colors. This is just the fundamental way that light works and how surfaces and materials work. Notice how this is a VEC3 as well. The reason why is because we have a whole spectrum of light really. And whilst more advanced path tracers and ray tracers will actually model that spectrum in a lot more of like a, an advanced way in a physically accurate way compared to just an RGB VEC3, an RGB VEC3 is still a, a good way to go because what will happen is based on this surface's color, we will absorb some of the light and we will reflect some of the light. And so for example, this is a yellow sphere. So it's gonna absorb a lot of blue light, which means that the blue values aren't going to be reflected as much. So let's just say this is like going to reflect 1.0 of red, 1.0 of green to get us yellow. And then like, it's just going to absorb all of the blue so it's going to give us a yellow sphere and that's going to be depicted inside this color variable. And this ray will of course keep going as many times as we have max reflections or until it terminates by hitting like the sky or just missing all the objects. And then we might use like just a, a sky color, for example, if that ray actually makes it out of the scene. Could also be an environment map or some kind of sky shader, I guess, that determines a nice looking sky. So basically it'll just be our environment. So that's what this is then. This is light energy, which is ever diminishing. Very, very important that you never add to this. If you take a look at this, we are always multiplying. We're not adding. The only time you can add to this is if you have a direct light. So if I have a directional light or a point light source in the scene that's actually emitting light, that will contribute more light to the scene and you can add to it. Same with emissive materials because they're obviously emitting light. But anything that does not emit light you, it always has to diminish. It's basically the fundamental law of energy conservation here, where we cannot create more energy than we have because we're always gonna lose energy. Just like if you put two mirrors side by side, you'll be able to see like an infinite reflection, but it will be getting progressively darker. Okay, we're focusing a little too much on the details, I think. Let's take a look at cast ray so we can see how that works. So here we go, we get our closest object. And this is, I imagine is just going to be some math. What is this comment over here? I'll take a look at that in a minute. But basically, I guess this is just, going to be yeah so we're just going to do some basic like ray object intersection here like a plane a cube a sphere and this is just going to be a simple yeah this is just a, a straightforward function if you take a look at my ray tracing series i have a math video that talks about like all of this math basically and i actually go through it like basically pen on paper. So if you're interested in the math specifically for this, then take a look at that video. Now going back to this get closest object function um boy or oh boy <laughs> Do I not like what I'm seeing here? This is what exactly? Objects, uniform float max objects, elements in one obj. Right, okay. So this, um, let me take a look quickly at how this is coming in. So this is our scene data 1D inside our scene. Okay, and that's how we fill it up. Okay, right. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. So basically what this is, uh, is yeah, our entire scene data, but packed into a float array. So instead of being like an array of structs or something, it's just flattened into this float array. And if we take a look at this, what this then is, is it's a little guide, uh, no idea why it starts with one, but it's a little guide that tells us what is in which, which index of that array. Because since we have just an array of floats, then there's gonna be elements in one object is gonna say how many floats are per object. That's why we multiply this because per each object, there's 23 floats inside this array. So in other words, every 23 floats, we move on to the next object. And then if we want to get like, you know, for example, the X, Y, Z position of the object, we need to access index zero, one, and two. And then you can see where then multiplying the index of the object we want by how many, like the stride basically, how many floats there are per object. So if we take a look, for example, at position, end and end is yeah just i times that so this is zero so i don't know why this is offset by one this guide that seems very misleading um so you can see for example to extract the position we're going to get just the it's going to be just a, at an offset of zero from the index of the object so for example the very first object in the scene i is zero so this is just zero so this is just zero so we're looking at objects index zero index one and index two to get the position of that object. So a sphere, for example. Now this can like 100% be improved dramatically. Um, and again, I would, I would never write it like this. I think at the bare minimum, uh, this person could have just at least given a name to these like random. So instead of having a comment that is your guide to deciphering this, you could have 
you know, for example, had like, I don't know, ob like position X, Y, and Z, and then set that to like zero, one, and two. And then at the very least, uh, this was, I think this was, let me just, at the very least, you know, this would have been like index plus the offset, ob position X, Y, and Z, right? Because that way you can see we can like, we don't have to be like, oh, w what index is it? Sorry. And, uh, you know, especially for things like this, like reflectivity is just 12, right? And we know it's 12 because it's 13 here. This is a, a, the other thing that is just mad. <laughs> the fact that this is offset by one for no reason. But anyway, so if we have a reflectivity and then that was set to, set to index 12, then we could just do that. And then there's no like, oh, what number is it again? So at the very like minimum, I would have done that. What I realistically would have done if you had to unpack this, like there's also no real you know, it's not mandatory that you store it like this. Another thing you could have done is just made a struct called object, which had these things in it. So we might have like a VEC3 position. You know, I think there was like a color, that reflectivity, which may have been a, a float, I think. So if we had all of this stuff here, you can just have a uniform of objects. And then we obviously wouldn't have this, but we just have max objects. The only reason I can see why maybe this wasn't done is because this requires you to I guess, know and account for like alignment. So you either pack these in a bit more of a smart way or you have to have padding. In OpenGL, there's also different like packing standards, I think. So you could be like, I think it's like layout SCD 430 versus one for, I don't, I don't remember all this OpenGL stuff, but the point is like, I can see why maybe it just would have been simpler to have an array of floats like this because then it's like tightly packed. The downside is you have to then unpack them. But to do that, I would have still had that struct called object. So you'd have your struct called object over here. Let me just quickly write it out. That'll be enough for now. And then I would have just written a function called like unpack object. Now this uh, objects that we have over here is just a uniform array all the way up here. So we, it's basically global like to this file. So I can just take in an index basically. Now the index over here, that's basically what I is. So I would take in I and then multiply it by elements in one object to get like the absolute index within that entire array. And then it's just a matter of, you know, here's our resulting object, which we return at the end. Now we just need to unpack it from that array. These you could define as offsets somewhere as well, just a bunch of constants that define where this sits in, inside your like structure if you want, but otherwise things like obtaining, you know, the position would just be us going into objects, having like an offset. So this would begin at an offset of zero. And then this will just be for, for Y and Z, it would just be this, you know, reflectivity, for example, would be like 12. I might even, instead of index, like I would probably call this something like offset, just because I think that makes a little bit more sense because the index really is which object index do you want to look at? That's what it implies to me. And then the offset is more like an offset index within that entire buffer, within that entire array. Yeah, so you would do that for all of the variables. And then obviously that means that instead, cause this is like, this is the other thing that I noticed. This is, this is fun, right? So the first thing we actually do here before we even begin, cause this is basically doing the same thing as what I'm doing. It's unpacking all of this, except it's definitely cluttering up the for loop with all of that stuff. And it's just completely unnecessary. And here's like an object that we have. So the concept of like having this object which is of type ray over here. But anyway, <laughs> I would make a separate struct for that probably. Having that done outside of this would massively clean this up. But the first thing that happens here is if objects six plus I times elements in one object, like you, this is crazy. So what is this exactly? Well, it's the type, right? Remember it's offset by one. So the type. So we're looking at the type first and making sure it's not equal to zero. So if it's like, I don't know, an object that doesn't need to be rendered or something like that, I don't know, I don't know exactly what that means, but sure, we need to check to make sure the type is not zero and then we can continue, right? This is again, just crazy. So instead of doing that, we can just get the object first, basically by just doing unpack object with I, here's our object, then let's just check the object type, right? So obviously you would have a float here, type, it would be at index six. There you go, done. So now you have that, you can easily check the type to see if it's not zero, much, much, much easier to read. And also all of this 
is done within this function. So this just becomes extremely clean and you can focus on doing what you're actually trying to do inside get closest object, which is figure out like presumably which object is the closest. So that I think would be a very meaningful improvement. Okay, let's quickly continue on. This is becoming a long video. So we have show normals, sure. If hit sky, then we apply sky box. Let's take a look at that. So if we miss, I guess we apply the sky box. This is just going to basically sample and it looks like it's, yeah, it looks like it's probably stored as like an equirectangular image. And then we're just doing some math over here to convert the VEC3 ray direction into like two dimensional texture coordinates within an equirectangular image. That's what I'm guessing is going on over here. So all this is doing is just returning a color, which we are then returning straight away. So this is if we miss everything, then the result basically of cast ray, which we then multiply with is going to be that skybox color. And then we get into some actual interesting functions, which is going to basically involve our materials, probability distribution function, stuff like that to determine where our ray is going for the next time. And also the specific color of that material as well. Just skimming through this, this seems, um, you know, I'm, again, I would refactor this quite a bit. The general print, like the general principle to me seems okay. It's definitely difficult to tell just in five seconds <laughs> what exactly is going on and if it's correct or anything. These if statements are somewhat going to determine what kind of material model we use for the specific hit. So we have an in out ray origin, ray direction. So part of what this function is going to do is also determine where our next ray origin will be and our next ray direction using that PDF, the probability distribution function that I mentioned. Yeah, and then there's our random chance to do specular versus diffuse. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all pretty standard. I just don't like the fact that it's all within one function. Again, it's a little bit limiting and it, it does make it unclear, especially when you've got returns halfway through the function. I would probably separate this out so that you had a function per material model that you decided to use instead of all your material models jammed into one function. I think using some better terminology as well, just making it clear what exactly exactly like your PDF is. Like ultimately the way that I always see these functions is that like you really should be treating them in my opinion as mathematical functions. So you have an input and you have an output. And when you hit something, like when you hit a sphere, for example, and then of course there might be like, sometimes there might be extra rays you need to cast out and you need to figure stuff out that might not be just your normal diffuse, like non-direct light source, you know, determining of color, but still generally you have your input into your material model and your output. And the output is generally like the color. So how much does this absorb, reflect, that kind of thing. But then also where does the ray go next? So where are you distributing, where are you scattering that ray to for the next frame? So those two things, in my opinion, need to be super clear and they're definitely not super clear. They're a bit all over the place, but there is still a lot to unpack here and we, we could go through this. If you guys are interested, please let me know in the comment section below. At this stage, we would be getting into more like math and core kind of path tracing, ray tracing functions compared to actual like program design and a code review, let's just say. So it might not be completely worth it, but if you guys want it, just let me know in the comment section below. I'll see what I can do. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this code review. I hope you enjoyed this whole series of us taking a look at this path tracer. It was fun. It was nice to take a look at a project like this. As I mentioned, if you want me to take a look at your project, send it into channel review at gmail.com. There will be some information in the description below. Thank you all for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye.